glory. Praise God. Are you excited to be here today? Come on now. None of you are. Hey, come on. Let's do that again. Are you excited to be here today? Do you everybody stand? I'd like to welcome you to Trinity Assembly of God. If ain't nobody told you they love you today, we love you. But most of all, Jesus loves you. Look at your neighbor, smile real big, and say, I'm glad you're here. Shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye, and say, I'm glad you're here. But I guarantee you, Jesus is glad you're here too. See what we're going to do. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's pray and ask God to have his way. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you again for an opportunity to come to Trinity Assembly of God today. Lord, I pray that you have your way in this service. Bless everybody, Lord, that will feel your presence, God. For somebody here today who doesn't know you, that today will be that day that they'll allow you to become the Lord of their lives. God, for somebody here who needs healing, you're a healing God, saving, healing God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We're excited to be here. In Jesus' wonderful name, everybody said amen. Let's give Jesus another hand clap of praise. Amen.
Thousands of tribes and tongues 
around the throne of God declaring, he said, I heard the sound as the thunders of the voices of many waters singing, worthy is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus is Lord this morning. And He's worthy of our praise. Amen? Worthy of our praise. Can we just give Him one more hand clap? Give Him one more hand clap. Amen? Hallelujah. To God be all the glory. To God be all the honor. Moses asked the children of Israel the question as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Who are we that we would have a God who hears us and answers us when we pray? Aren't you glad that our God is attentive to our needs? As we go before Him this morning, let's continue to lift up all of our friends and family that are sick. Several are at home with bugs and viruses this morning. But we, we believe that Jesus is still the healer. We're still lifting up Donna Prime, her family, her parents. Uh, Billy Horn's nephew, Brian. Still praying for Stephanie's father, Brother Herman, Sister Bertie Kent. Many others that's on the list today. Uh, but God knows them. All of our friends and family at Generations is there and continue to believe that God's going to bring revival to our nation and revival to Red Bay. Amen? And uh, we, just, we just thank God for His goodness. If you have a need for prayer, this morning, lift up your hand. As we look around the room, we see, we agree with you, and we pray with you. We join me in prayer right now. Father, we come before you again to say thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you. You are worthy. You alone are worthy. You alone, God. You alone. You're the only one deserving of our praise. None other. And Jesus, your name is still a name above every name. We believe that you are the same today, yesterday, and forever, that you do not change. So, Lord, the things we read about in your word that happened, God, Lord, nearly 2,000 years ago, the miracles, the needs that were met, the provisions that were given, God, we believe still today that you're the same God who can do the same thing. Lord, we praise you today that you're not confined or restricted by, uh, by time or by walls of a building. But Lord, you're right here this morning. And as you're here, Lord, you're extending your hand out to those, Lord, that cannot be with us. Lord, I just pray your blessings, Father, upon, upon our country, upon our nation, upon our local areas, upon our local congregations and churches this morning, Lord, again. Lord, as we celebrate Jesus. And Lord, as we celebrate the finished work that you've done on the cross to know that you are our one and only Savior. You, we know that you are our healer. We know that you are a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And we know that you are a soon coming King. And we rejoice in the fact today, Lord, that we know you as our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray your blessings upon each one and you would receive honor and glory in the name of Jesus. And all God's people have said, Amen. Why don't you turn around and greet somebody this morning? I know you already have, but welcome each other to the house of the Lord. And if you're visiting with us, if you happen to be visiting with us, we are double blessed and honored to have you. So let's give our visitors a hand clap of welcome this morning, church. Come on. Amen. And look around as you see people here today, and as you look and you don't see people, shoot them a text this afternoon or during the week. Say, we missed you this morning. Hope you're doing well. We're praying for you. It don't take much time at all to do that. And that can go a long way to help and encourage somebody. But God is good, isn't he? Amen. God is good. Our usher is going to come forward at this time to receive a morning tithe and offering. And uh, I want to say thank you again for your faithfulness in giving. And uh, the, one of the great, you'll find one of the greatest joys of living is giving, if you'll just do it. And because the Bible says God blesses the cheerful giver. But I'm telling you, uh, when Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, you only learn that by experience. So we thank you for your faithfulness in giving uh, this morning as God has blessed you to give. And we know that God will continue to bless you. Brother Wesley, would you pray over our offering today? Amen and amen. God bless you again as you give. Man, it is good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, as you are giving in the offering, if you'll... Uh, listen, I've got a few announcements I want to share with you. Uh, of course, this evening at 6 o'clock uh, at First Baptist Church here in Red Bay is our community Easter service. If you would like to sing in the community choir, be there at 5 o'clock. 
They will have choir practice at 5 o'clock at First Baptist. That's for community choir. They would welcome you to become and help make a joyful noise together tonight for the Lord. So be at First Baptist at 5. If you want to sing in the choir, be there at 6 for the service. And I do covet your prayers. Uh, as uh, I've said before, uh, we cast lots. Lots fell on me, and I'll be bringing the word tonight. So please, please pray for me that God would just use me for his glory. Next Sunday afternoon from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock here at church, weather permitting, we're going to do our Easter egg hunt and fellowship cookout. And we're, going to, we're planning on doing everything outside this year. So if you want to bring a chair, bring a canopy, bring side dishes for hot dogs and hamburgers, bring drinks, and uh, we're going to have a good time. We're going to have some things set up for kids. Uh, uh, you know, what makes kids more fun is when adults are having fun like a kid. Did y'all hear me say that right? What makes kids more fun is when we adults decide we're going to have fun like a kid. Because you don't have to grow cold just because you grow old. Come on, amen. Now, I have to be cautious because my hinges are rusty now. But I'm going to still squeak along. Amen. Some of you identify with that and resemble that remark, just don't like to admit it. But anyway, I'm looking forward to a great time. What a better way to celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Lord, but coming together as a church family. Invite your friends and family to come from 5 to 7 next Sunday afternoon. April the 20th. April the 20th is coming. It's hard to, it's, it's kind of hard to believe I'm up here already fixing to announce things going on in April already. But April the 20th on Saturday from 12 to 5 is the Wheels of Faith second annual cruise in. Start kicked it off last year. It turned out to be a great success. And uh, there'll be booths set up. If you want to set up a booth uh, to sell crafts or whatever, uh, if you want to set up a booth to represent a ministry in this church, you need to see Brother Mike uh, as soon as possible so they can get you a spot reserved, him and BJ. And uh, we're looking forward to a great weekend that weekend as well. There'll be other things coming up on our calendar. We'll try to keep you informed as, as much as possible. And uh, we, we just thank God for the opportunity to do what we do. And we do what we do for the glory of our Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So good to see you. Thank you for being committed to be here today. Take your Bibles and turn them with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I want to begin reading in verse 12, and I will go through verse 27. This scripture so appropriately fits the occasion on our calendar. According to our calendar, today is called the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem the very week he was crucified. I know you can read commentators, you can read articles where there may be some, some discrepancies in the date, the exact date, because the Jewish calendar is different than our calendar. But I'm going to tell you what, let's don't get hung up on the technicalities and let's just realize the reality that Jesus did ride into Jerusalem on a donkey he was crucified at the end of that week, but on the third day he rose again. Amen? Amen? So thank God for the facts of what happened and that we call the triumphant entry. And in verse 12 of chapter 12 of John says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. The feast referred to here was they had gathered to celebrate the feast of Passover. And we know what Passover was. Passover is to celebrate God's deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt under the rulership of Moses. And we won't go into the details, but that's where the first Passover lamb was slain, that the blood should be applied to the doorpost, that that tenth plague that God put up on the Egyptians, when the death angel came, the ones who had the blood applied to the doorpost, their household was saved. Their firstborn of their household was saved. How many of you know today we're still saved by the applying of the blood, not on the doorpost, but on our hearts? Amen? I'm glad today we've been saved by the blood, sanctified by the blood, redeemed by the blood, purchased by the blood, justified by the blood, and there's still power in the blood of Jesus. Amen? But here, so they came to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, said on it as it was written, Fear not, Daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. That's Zechariah 9, 9, as he's quoting from here. That's prophesied by Zechariah. In verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first. 
But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and, they, and that they had done these things to him. When you're in the moment of the situation, it's hard, it's hard sometimes to understand the purpose and the outcome it's intended. I mean, you know, hindsight's 2020. Amen? That's what the disciples had here. They didn't understand this. Let me just go ahead and interject this this morning. You may not understand why you're going through what you're going through right now, but God's got a purpose. God doesn't waste opportunities just to show himself faithful and strong to you in your situations. Hold on to that promise. And then verse 17, Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason the people also met him because they had heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The, the Pharisees was the religious people who were charged with guarding and protecting the law of God, but they had, make it, they had made it a system of legalism instead of what God had intended to be a system of relationship. And they had went to extremes of that. We know, many of you all know that. And when they said, look, the world, they're talking about the people who don't believe the way we believe. The people who has rejected the way of the pharisaical laws, if you will. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll see some more people here they're referring to. Let's just keep reading the text. Verse 20. For now there were Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Later on, you'll see these people called in the Bible Hellenists. The Hellenists were Jews that spoke the Greek language. Some of them were proselytes and some of them are Jew by birth that, that didn't grow up in the culture of the city of Jerusalem. And they were rejected by some of the Pharisees and possibly what the Pharisees was referring to here is these people being of the world. Now look what happened. They wanted to come and, and no doubt they'd heard about what Jesus done. No doubt many of them had seen what Jesus had done. But then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Then Jesus gets involved in the conversation. Now look at this. And we don't know for sure, but I believe there was a curiosity stirred up in these Greeks, these Hellenist Jews. They wanted to know more about Jesus. They wanted to know why he had come into Jerusalem that day, maybe, perhaps. But Jesus began to unfold to them the purpose of why he was committed to the cause. If you're looking for a title this morning, that's it. Committed to the cause. Thank God that Jesus was committed to the purpose of God to come not only to be laid in a manger and we can celebrate the festivities of Christmas, all the beautiful lights, the decorations, the presents, and talk about a babe laying in a manger, but that babe laid in the manger was appointed to die on a cross. Appointed to die the most cruel death that anybody knew at that time in human history. But Jesus knew that his birth brought an appointment to die on the cross, but he was destined to sit on a throne. Yeah, come on. But before he could get from the manger to the throne, he had to go by the way of the cross, to go by the way of the grave, to be a resurrection, which shows us today, my friends, that death and hell cannot defeat what God has intended for your life. Yeah. Amen. Yes, that's worth celebrating. Thank God for that. Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Look at verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Committed to the cause. No one can understate the value, or no one could, let me rephrase that, no one can overemphasize the value of commitment. We need to understand that. Jesus came riding into town on a donkey. Yeah, it was, it was a sign of his humility, sign of his coming in peace. 
Donkeys were not a popular animal to be ridden on at that time because I don't know how many of you have ever ridden a donkey. Their gait is horrible. They will, I'm going to tell you, they will, they will kick your rear in. Literally more ways than one. Especially if you don't have a saddle. But a donkey was known, I mean, they're temperamental. I mean, I, I, I grew up on a farm. We never had donkeys. Donkeys are good now. Matter of fact, donkeys have an instinctive nature. They hate dogs. So if you've got animals on your farm and coyotes are getting in them, just get you a couple of donkeys and put out there. I mean, they have donkeys to take care of them. But Jesus now, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah, comes riding into town on a donkey. Donkeys were known to be ridden by royalty during times of peace, not time of war. So what has Jesus said? Jesus is saying, as he, he's showing the people as they come into town, that he's coming in town with an attitude of humility, an attitude to bring peace, and not to create controversy and war. He knew he was going into town to be betrayed. He knew he was going into town only to be appointed in a few days after that to be beaten, rejected by his closest friends, be beaten with a cat of nine tails, have flesh ripped off his body, have his beard plucked out, be spit upon, cursed on, and yet have nails driven in his hands and feet and hang six cruel hours on a hill called Calvary and die a cruel, slow death of asphyxiation. But why did he do that? Because he knew there was a greater purpose. Now, horses were coming for, to be ridden during time of war. Now, let me just go ahead and interject this. The first time Jesus come riding into town on a donkey, the next time he comes riding in, he's coming in on a white horse. Amen. 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 Read Revelation. We win. If you believe in Jesus, if you put your heart and trust in Jesus, we win. But that's the greater cause that Jesus was committed to because he, know, he knew what the outcome was going to be because he surrendered himself to the will of the Father. Yeah, the people celebrated. They were waving the palm branches, putting their coats on the road, crying out a song of those out of Lord save us now. And they were celebrating and the Pharisees tell them to be quiet and Jesus said, if these be quiet, the rocks should cry out in their place. But I want to tell you what really happened here. People were caught, it shows us the very core of our human nature, how we can get so caught up in the moment of the celebration, but we're really not committed to the cause. Why? Where were the people at five days after that when Jesus was on trial? Where were they at when they were saying, you want Barabbas, the murderer, the thief? Or do you want Jesus who we can find no fault in? Crucify Jesus, they cried. They were caught up in the moment of the celebration, but they were not committed to the cause of his purpose. Friends, let's don't get caught in the trap of the same thing in our life today. Let's don't get caught up in the moment of celebration and forget that God has a higher purpose and cause than just living for the moment. Amen? Y'all have heard the story of the chicken and the pig, right? Chicken and pig walking down through town. They see this sign on the restaurant. It says, ham and eggs, $5.95, breakfast special. The chicken looks at the pig and says, well, that's kind of sad that all we can contribute to society is breakfast food. The pig replied, you may, it may be a contribution for you, but for me it's a total commitment. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. Just a few lines into the story, you can see the difference between commitment and contribution. The chicken brags about his contribution to society, but as it proudly reads a sign that advertises their good deed, but the pig remains somber and serious as he thinks about his own contribution that they have made breakfast great for humanity, but for the pig, the ham represents a total loss of one of its own kind and predicts a future for him that one day he will be bacon and ham. That's commitment. Amen? It's commitment. It's a simple illustration that gives us a profound picture of true commitment as giving of self even when one's reputation, integrity, heart, and even life are on the line. In real life, pigs don't really have a choice as long as we continue to eat bacon and ham. And that's one of my favorite meats, y'all. Give me just a good old grilled pork chop. I'm messing with your mind already. I know that. Your mouth will begin to sobble right now. And you can smell the pork chops grilling on the grill. Come on, don't shout me down. 
but there's a difference in contributing and being a commitment to that contribution. This, this one writer says, making a commitment entails sacrifice. It's binding oneself to a course of action, a promise, a pledge, or firm agreement. To make a commitment, therefore, involves seriousness of disposition, sincerity of decision, steadfastness towards its completion. Breaking it can easily damage integrity and reputation. Life is our so-called modern, and life in our so-called modern area has conditioned us to desire a life of ease, a life of quick gratification and less, with less discomfort. There's really nothing wrong with desiring an easier life. There's really nothing wrong. The Bible doesn't say that, but the Bible does warn us there's pleasure in sin, but it's only for a season. Amen? But the, the generation now, we, we are in a time and culture now that where many expect to receive abundant rewards with putting forth minimal effort. It's so easy to give up on something that requires extra effort, sacrifice of time, sharing of wealth, and, and giving up on legitimate goals to be sought through uh, illegitimate means, provided that some means offer to a shortcut to that goal in mind. People are, by nature, look for the easy way out. They want the maximum rewards for the minimum effort. You know what that's really called? Lazy. Y'all getting really quiet on me this morning. Again, remember, I'm talking about commitment. Commitment to the cause. Long-term commitments have decreased in popularity because of the sacrifice that it entails. Commitment is one of the values that under and strong and beneficial relationships. People who can maintain strong relationships rank higher, according to studies that's been done. People who can maintain strong relationships rank higher in their emotional intelligence, and they are most likely to fulfill their commitments and to stay committed. This is so because it takes emotional competence to sacrifice time, exercise considerable will, and to exert substantial effort. People who value commitments are highly skilled in managing relationships, especially in the area of interpersonal effectiveness, conflict management, building bonds, building trust, teamwork, and collaboration. I get my tangle tongued up. Y'all bear with me. As that writer goes on and says, commitment is a personal thing. It's a strong indicator of self-discipline, resilience, and persistence. It's a value that determinates the stout-hearted from the weak. People who are committed to do their very best, even outside their comfort zones. They hurdle difficulties to fulfill their commitments, not only to others, but also to themselves, because they are focused. Their choices in life are clear, and they know their way towards their goals. People who are not committed, lack focus, usually end up with many bad choices or hazy choices. Confusion in life. They struggle in sacrificially working toward their dreams and holding on to it. They lack competence in self-management, especially in, in areas of integrity, achievement, drive, realistic, optimism, resilience, and integrity. And the bottom, the, the, it bottoms down to this, friends. A lot of our spiritual struggles come from our lack of commitment to our life in Christ. Albert Einstein said this. Only one who devotes himself to a cause with his whole strength and soul can be a true master. For this reason, mastery demands all of a person. How did Jesus do what he did? Because he was committed to the cause of his father. Looking forward to a greater purpose than just himself, but he looked ahead and saw me and you where we are right now. So why? He went to the cross for me and you. He was committed. I talk to pastors all across the state and the country, and they say one of the, one of the struggles they have as a pastor is a lack of commitment of involvement from membership. If the shoe fits, wear it. But I'm going to tell you there's a value in commitment when you commit your life to the cause of Christ. Number one here from this passage of Scripture, commitment is dedication to the process. Does it just bring things into being overnight? Look at the illustration or the example Jesus used here, talking to these Greeks and talking to his disciples. He said, he who loves his life will lose it. That's what he said. Then he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, to understand the, the meaning of the scripture, looking in the original language, I've got to understand that Jesus was using, speaking metaphorically of the difference in love and hate, what you put first matters most. 
And when you put your own self-gratification ahead of everything else, you're going to wind up losing the real meaning of life. Hello. That's what we've been trained in our culture. And he said then, he looked at, he used a seed as an example, and he said, except a, a, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it's going to bite alone. Jesus understood the principle of him giving his life, dying, being buried, and raised again in the third day. Can I go ahead and just jump ahead and tell you, I don't know about other fellowships and denominations around the world, but last year alone in the Assemblies of God, every 56 seconds, 24 hours a day around the world, somebody gave their heart to Jesus. Yeah. Every 56 seconds. You do the math. What am I saying? Every 56 seconds, hell lost another one. Yeah. Why? Because there was a seed planted in the ground. His name was Jesus. And He didn't stay in the ground. He came forth on the third day, resurrection. He died that we might live. Now He lives so we can have life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And that's what He's telling him. He said, man, you got to get to the point where you understand the value of the process. A seed planted in the ground don't just come up overnight. A seed stocked on the shelf will never come up. And he's relating this to our life and how we live our life. The grain is so with human life. One of two things you can do with your life. You can be consume your life with your own present gratification and profit to satisfy your present cravings and taste to secure the largest amount of immediate enjoyment for yourself so you can eat your life, metaphorically, or you can devote your life to giving to God to be buried and die to self and live to Christ and see fruits of the Spirit abound to you that benefits others and brings fulfillment in your life. The only way to have true fulfillment in your life, friends, is to find life in Jesus Christ. You can win all the contests you want to win. And I like that. I'm competitive. I've told you all this before. Anybody that tells you it doesn't matter whether you win or lose is lying to you. Really. Because I don't believe anybody. If you, if you don't matter winning and losing, I don't want to play a game with you and I don't want you on my team. Because I don't believe anybody has got any self-worth about them want to lose. Hello? Am I right? Now, don't cheat to win. A cheater is just a loser from the beginning. Now, I'm not calling y'all cheaters, you know. But, you know, it's kind of like our former district superintendent, Bud Volley Lambert, who ordained me in the ministry. And he loved golf. He loved it so much that when he retired, he moved into a gated community in Montgomery right on a golf course. And he, he told me one time, he said, Brother David, let me tell you, the best way to get out of a, out of a sand trap. His wife's sitting there at the table. I said, I'll do that, Brother Lambert. I need some pointers. My golf game's horrible. He said, you tee that ball up. Some of you golfers in here know, yeah, that would be an easy way to get out of a sand trap, wouldn't it? Sister Lambert looked at him and said, looked at me and said, Brother David, don't listen to Valdi. He's supposed to be your mentor and your guide, and he's telling you how to cheat. He said, well, that don't matter. She said, what do you mean that don't matter? You need to hush. He said, golf don't matter to God. He said, the only things that matter to God really is called cheating. I understand Brother Lambert's sense of humor. But we cannot afford to lose the value of commitment and understand that true commitment must go through a process in order for it to accomplish its purpose. Things don't just happen overnight. Amen? And this is what Jesus was telling them here. There's a process I'm going to do the process of giving my life. He who lose, loves his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it for eternal life. And really, really talking is, where's your priorities? What are we focusing upon? Do we, see, do we see the excitement of the moment to celebrate without missing the cause and being committed to the cause? Jesus goes on and tells his disciples in another narrative, the same context in Mark, he asked the question, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Nothing. He said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul and mark? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father. The law of the seed is the law of human life. We must be willing to die to self and live to Christ. And Jesus made that possible because he was committed to the cause of giving his life for us. Many of y'all remember the stories, the movie. It was called The End of the Spear. They made a book, they wrote a book out of it. It was about Jim Elliott, the missionary. He went into South America to reach out to the indigenous tribes. And he didn't stay there long. To him and his couple of his guys got killed. Flew the plane in, landed on a, in a river. 
and they found in his journals, and y'all read this, y'all heard this, and of course there was, because of his sacrifice, his wife and others went back in, and they had great success in reaching these natives who had never heard about Jesus. And Jim Elliott, they found in his journal this phrase written down, and many of you have heard this and know this, but it's due to be repeated this morning that no man is a fool to give up that what he cannot keep in order to gain that what he cannot lose. So where are we, are we committed to the cause this morning? Number two, commitment requires a servant's heart. Jesus said this in John 26, 12, 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. A servant's heart. What is a servant's heart? A servant looks for a greater cause outside yourself. You're in it to help somebody else. That's completely contrary and contradictory to our culture in America right now. Everything we do in America, you see it on media, you watch it on sitcoms, you watch it on movies. It's all about getting what you can get and doing it for yourself. Friends, that's completely opposite to what Jesus said. If you really want to know the meaning of life, learn how to serve for the benefit of your fellow man. Don't come from saying, what's in it for me? Come say, what can I do to help somebody else? Hello? It doesn't mean you become a rug to be walked on. Being a Christian doesn't mean, my friends, that you have to be stepped on and rubbed on and somebody has to put their heels in your back. But I'm telling you, you can stand strong, but yet you can have a servant's heart with, with the benefits of others in mind. This is the exact example Jesus gave us when he himself willingly laid his life down. He told his disciples, serve me. Understand the value of this commitment of dedicating yourself to a greater cause and purpose comes from serving me. And not only serve me, but then follow me. Because I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to be here to help you to do it. You're not going to be alone. Aren't you glad this morning, my friends, that God doesn't ask us to do something without equipping us to do it? And what we mess up a lot of times is we try to look within ourselves. It created huge problems for me for nearly over eight years when God... After God first put the call in my life to come and, and be a minister, be a pastor, and I said, man, I can't do it. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not qualified. And I, I'm definitely not going to get up in front and speak in front of a group of people. And it's still, I, I was telling Josh this morning, after over 30 years, it's still not easy. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or make you feel sorry for me, but I'm going to tell you, human nature, we can get the best of you if we leave God out of the equation. But when I surrendered to follow Him and let the Holy Spirit take over my life, it brought a spirit of humility, but yet a confidence to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can in your life too. Come on, amen. 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 Come on, amen. Yeah. When we ought to just, that, that, ought, that ought to bring some old Pentecostal blood out of some people right there if you want to be traditional, but I'm not traditional this morning. But if you're a true child of God, it ought to bring a little bit of spirit of excitement in you when you have a promise that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We ought to repeat that together this morning. Say it with me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Amen? Yeah. Let me just go on and add another promise to that. Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him who is able to do far and exceedingly abundantly begin anything that I can think or even imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Hallelujah. What kind of power? The power that Paul talks about in Romans 8, 11, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave yeah. shall also quicken or give this, it's this mortal body life. It is through surrendering our all for the better cause of our fellow men as we follow Jesus so they can see Jesus in us and they say, man, there's something different about her. There's something different about him. I want to know what's made the difference in their life. And you can say what? Man, I've committed my life to Jesus as my Lord and I follow him. Where he leads me, I go. Where he guides, I follow. Amen, come on. Amen. That's what true commitment's about. People lose the value of church attendance. They lose the value of of true meaning in life when they refuse to follow Jesus and commit to themselves instead of being committed to be a servant. And the beauty of this, look at this. The third thing in this is in the scripture. The beauty of commitment is great rewards for it. Great benefits. You know? Don't come to church out of obligation. Don't assemble yourself to worship out of obligation. Come because of the blessings that you can be to somebody else. Then in return, God's going to bring blessings in your life. 
And in the greatest blessing of all, look at what Jesus said here in that passage of Scripture. Look at this in John 12, verse 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And look at the next phrase. For where I am, there my servant will be also. There's nothing better in life than to know you're walking in the presence of God. And His presence is with you. But Jesus wasn't just speaking about the moment for the moment that you're in. The moment of the celebration. Jesus was talking about there's a better day coming. I'm going to keep preaching that until he comes back. The best is still yet to come for those who serve Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you, the greatest blessing of all is to know one day we're not going to stay where we are. And you're going to hear me say that time and time again. My friends, we're going to be with him forever. Right, where I am, there you can be too. Friends, the only way you can get to where Jesus is is to let, to let him be the Lord of your life. There's not many ways to heaven. You don't get to heaven by being a good old boy, a good old girl. You don't get to heaven by joining a local church or going through church disciplines. I'm like an old guy said, you can be baptized in every pond, creek, and river in the county and know every catfish by name and still die and go to hell. Hello. You can pay tithes. You can go to church and never miss a church service. You can do all the good things you want to and still die and go to hell. Amen. It's good to be baptized. Jesus commanded us to be baptized. Jesus, the Word of God, commands us to tithe and give in offerings. I heard Dr. Mark Rutland say this the other day. He said, people come to you and say, well, Dr. Rutland, tithing's under the law. We're under grace now. He said, I simply look at them and ask them one question. What gives more, grace or the law? Something to think about it. What gives more, grace or the law? Obvious. Obvious. Jesus, giving your life for Jesus matters most. Because he gave his life for us and comes with great rewards. And no greater thing to know that, friends, there's a future coming. Everybody knows John 14, 1 through 3. You ever been to a funeral? You've heard it probably more times than one. But in the Jesus' last words as he's meeting with his disciples before they would see him betrayed and see him hang on the cross, he said, let not your heart be troubled. For if you believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Why would he tell us that? For in my Father's house are many mansions. You know what? The literal translation of that is, for in my Father's kingdom, there's many rooms. We're going to be a family. Yeah, we're, we're all going to live together. Some people don't like that concept. You know why you don't like that concept? Because you're not, you don't have a service heart. Uh-oh. I want my own space. I want my own condo. I want my, I want my own. Some people just... Just cheaping themselves and sell off a little cabin in the corner of glory. I don't think there's going to be any little cabins in the corner of glory. There's going to be a mansion. Amen. Hello? But in that is a place for the family of God. And Jesus said, because I am going away to prepare a place for you. If, I would not, if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, that where I am, there you may be also. How many of you know you're ready for heaven this morning? If you don't know Jesus by your, as Lord and Savior, you're not ready for heaven. But if you know Him as Lord and Savior, you're ready. And Jesus said, for those that follow Him, imitate me. Do what I do. You see me do something, you do it. You act like I act. You love like I love. You, you serve like I serve. You follow me. Let me be your example. Then you exemplify that to those around you. As Brother Patrick and I love the scripture from Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Can people tell you're a Christian by your actions? You know why it's so important? Because commitment has more to do with what you do than what you say. Can I say that again? Commitment has more to do with what you do than what you say. Amen? We don't like that. Our human nature doesn't. We, we'd rather have the celebration than the big party all the time. The commitment comes with reward and benefits because one day we're going to be with Jesus. Amen? Jesus prayed that prayer in John 17, 24. Father, I desire that my, they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given to me. Friends, we can look back and remember Jesus as a baby in a manger, as a lamb on the cross, and as a scarred body. But friends, let's look forward to see him robed in white 
and on his vesture there's a there's a name that's above every name. On his head there's a crown. Friends, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords this morning. I'm looking forward to seeing him in his glory. How about you? So I'm going to be committed to the cause. Because true commitment comes from having a purpose. Establish a purpose in your life and be committed to it. And Jesus said, for this purpose I came to this hour. For this very reason. Yes, I know. I know. I don't really understand maybe in my humanity, in my form of humanity that I'm in, just how bad it's going to be to be whipped and beaten the way I will be and to be rejected. But I know for this purpose I've come to this hour that my Father may be glorified. And I want you to understand that I'm doing this for you. I'm bare, I'm just like a grain that's going to be buried in the, a grain of seed that's going to be buried in the ground. But friends, because of my death, there's going to be much fruit to come. And he's wanting to put himself in us this morning. But he says there's a purpose in this. And for this very hour, I've come to this purpose. That I might through the death of myself on the cross reconcile you to the Father. That your sin might be replaced with my righteousness and your loneliness might be replaced with my friendship. Your hopelessness might be replaced with my hope and your hurting can be healed by my healing. Jesus came to do it all for us. Where are you this morning, friend? What are you going through this morning? Don't forget to be to just say, Lord, I'm going to commit myself. To, we don't have to understand it all. We don't have to figure it all out. All we got to do is trust that He did what He did for us. And hold on to that love. Hold on and be committed. Commit to that purpose. And let the main purpose of your life be the purpose of honoring and living for Jesus. And then everything else will line itself up. And He never promised us it would be easy. But He did promise us if we commit our life to Him, Make Him the delight of our life. He can give us the desires of our heart. Because when you commit Him and delight your life in Him, the desire of your heart is going to line right up with what He wants for you. There's nothing wrong with having big goals. Young people, have set yourself some goals. Pursue, pursue the education that's necessary to achieve that goal. It might not be college. It might be Voltec training. There's some great jobs out there you can get. But if you want to go to college, set your goals. Older people, some people are just kind of looking for their second win. You know, going through a life crisis. The only way life has a crisis is if you let it become a crisis. Yeah, life will present challenges, but see that challenge as an opportunity for the next adventure and the next victory that God can bring in your life. And listen, listen yeah, yeah I, I'm, I, can't, I joke around about it. I understand I can't do what I used to do. It don't take me long. I, I went to co-op this week and late one afternoon and got me some fertilizer from my garden, from my fruit trees, and them 50-pound bags felt like they ate about 200 pounds. When used to, I could pick up two in one hand or put them down on my shoulder. I'm not, I mean, because I'm not what everything I used to be. But thank God I'm not everything I used to be. But praise God, He's working on me to make me what I ought to be. But I understand, don't give up on life just because it seems you're running out of time with life. I got a message that I'm going to re-preach and I'm redoing sometime. When God lets me, but I'm going to tell you, look at, look at Caleb when he was 85 years old. He said, let me have the mountains. Let me go up there where the giants are. I'm going to run them out of the land. 85. Caleb says, you know what? I'm going to start better than I finished. Don't give up on life. Be committed to the purpose, but be sure your purpose is to honor God in all you do. Whatever vocation you pursue. Paul, Apostle Paul tells us, and told the church at Colossae, do everything that you do with a passion as you do it for the Lord. That's commitment. But be sure your purpose is to live for the Lord. And it can be committed to that purpose. That's exactly what Jesus did. It didn't make sense that he would bring salvation. That he would bring peace. He would bring hope to Jerusalem by dying on the cross. And it still doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But I want to tell you what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The power of God. What kind of power does God have, friend? Come on. Amen. What kind of power does God have? It's under salvation, but it's unlimited power, which means there's unlimited potential in your life when you commit to the purpose of Christ in your life that His strength can be your strength. His hope can be your hope. His peace can be your peace. His joy can be your joy. 
Yeah, I know life will suck it out of you. And no doubt many, even the, even the disciples of Jesus, didn't understand this, as text tells us, until after the fact. But I want to tell you, friends, God has given us his word to show us the facts and to reveal to us the truth, that no matter where you are right now, you can make it if you hold on to him. Jesus was committed to that cause, and you, you are that cause. We are that cause. And that's why he did what he did. No, it didn't make sense that he would, their hope would come from man hanging on a tree. The Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world has now become the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and he sits on the throne, reigning as King and King of Lord of Lords. And the Bible says he's at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for me and you. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that Jesus, we are to look to Jesus, who is the author and faith of faith, but he said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame and the suffering of the cross, and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's done it for us. He was committed to the cause. Look at your neighbor right now and tell him, come on, help me out as we conclude this. You're the reason. He died on Calvary. Come on. You are. You're the reason. You're the reason. Stand to your feet with me. <clears throat> Jesus was completely committed to the will of the Father for our well-being. Committed, completely committed to show how tremendous a self-sacrifice and obedience involved that he was willing to give up his life. He looked beyond where he was. He looked beyond the moment of the situation. And he looked ahead to 2024 right here at this moment and saw you right where you are right now in the moment of need in your life. And he did it. He did it. He did it for me and you. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for your commitment to give us the example of the value of being completely sold out for your cause, for your purpose. God, no matter what vocation we may be in life, Lord, whether we're uh, an engineer, doctor, a nurse, restaurant owner, restaurant manager, or waiting tables, God, or labor on the factory lines, it doesn't matter. That's irrelevant, God. Lord, thank you that you provided ways and means that we can make a living. But wherever we are, God, let us see today, God, I pray through the power of the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that our eyes would be open to see the reality that what really makes life matter is letting you be the center of our life. Being committed, committing our life to you, Lord. And knowing, God, as we lay down our heads on our pillows, if we don't wake up in this world, when we wake up, we'll see your face that will be where you are the promise of life. The promise, God, of peace. God, I just praise you this morning for every individual that's in this room today, God, that's in this sanctuary. I praise you, God, for all the people around the world that's come to reality to know how great your love is, how great and amazing is your grace. So, Lord, I pray for encouragement right now, God. I pray for strength. I pray, God, that we can come to the reality, Lord, to see there's a greater cause and that, Lord, you do work through everything for good. So, Father, today, speak into hearts, God. I know you already have. Encourage lives, Lord, I pray. Just thank you, Jesus. You did what you did, and you did it for us. You did it for us. Your head bowed and your eyes closed right now. Can I ask you to look deep into your heart this morning and ask yourself, am I really, am I, am I really committed to Christ in my life? Am I really committed to living my life, to follow Him? Am I really committed to His cause and to His purpose? Am I really? That's an answer to a question that only you can answer. answer. But you must answer it for yourself. And I'm going to encourage you today. If you're struggling in life, know that God understands. Know that Jesus sees where you are. And don't give up on, on putting your faith and trust in Him. 
and maybe you're here this morning and you're about at your wit's end and, and I know life can do that to us. I'm not going to deny the reality that things can be hard sometimes, but it wasn't easy for Jesus to do what He did. But He did it. So you can know that where you are right now, you can make it when you put your hand in His hand. Trust Him with it. Simply put this morning, if you need prayer or want prayer for anything in your life, to commit your life to Christ, to rededicate your life to Jesus, or just for strength in your struggles you're going through, come right now. Come and just and let's, let's just give it to the Lord. Come on. I'm done this morning, okay? If they want to sing, they can sing. As they sing, you want prayer, you need prayer, and you want prayer, come. Get out behind your seat and come up here. And let's pray about it. Let's give it to the Lord. Right now, it's between you and God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this people. And thank you for your presence. And thank you, Lord, for your goodness. So, in Jesus' name I pray. Right now, Father, we wait on you. Let's just wait a few minutes this morning. Wait just a few seconds right now. In the name of Jesus. I just, I need that hope. I need that healing. I need that assurance. Just step out. Come on. Jesus, that he was committed to you, committed to the cause for you. Just begin to thank him for life. Begin to thank him for your salvation. Begin to thank him for your provisions and the hope you have in him this morning. Just begin to praise him with me.
gospel of John in chapter 10 that no one took your life you freely lay it down and you gave your life for all that we could have life Lord you said the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy but you come to give us life and we might have it more abundantly so Father I pray the abundance of life over this congregation today Lord I pray Lord that maybe something I've said or read from your word God today will continue to echo and ring into hearts and encourage minds and hearts Lord Father, I thank you again. Jesus, thank you again. That that day you rode into Jerusalem, yes, they were celebrating. Lord, they didn't understand the commitment you had for them or why you would go willingly give your life. But Lord, thank you today. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the freedom we have that you're a resurrected Savior. Thank you for the power of the gospel, the power of the cross. And I pray your blessings over each one in this building in the name of Jesus. For your glory. To God be the praise. Amen. Hope we can see you at First Baptist at 6 this afternoon. Uh, again, I cover your prayers. If you want to sing in the community choir, be there at 5. God bless you. Shake some hands and hug some necks. And please, again, if you want to be, or have a booth or do something with Wheels of Faith, cruise in, see, see Brother Mike before you leave. God bless y'all. We love you.